fires one towards the goal. That's going to be clubbed by Travis Ridgen. Well, this is more like it. This is Slang in the Biscuit. Here's Travis Ridgen and Dave Wheeler. If you smell a delicious, crispy smell at the end of the race, it's not your tailpipe. It's a little bit of shake and bake. You shake it. I think I bake it. <laughs> Great film. Great film. Wish they would have done a sequel. Hey, Ricky, how do I turn up the radio and the TV at the same time? Why would I tell you that, man? You stole my wife. I don't know, because I like the party. <laughs> Uh, that the uh, the woman that plays Ricky Bobby's wife, and then um, uh, John C. Riley's wife is the same woman that hooked up with uh, Robert Downey Jr., aka Tony Stark, in Iron Man One. She was the reporter. Well, he had Pepper Potts. No, uh, what was her name? Uh, G- uh, Gwyneth Paltrow. Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah, they got married eventually. I actually got a whole bunch of uh, Iron Man in. I went back and watched a bunch of old movies over my week off, and it was awesome. Ooh, which we'll get to later on in the show. Today's show is going to be really exciting. Yeah. We got. Dave's trip. Dave played for the first time in almost three years, skating at MTS Center, home of the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, we got a new team, kind of, sort of, for me, which we'll get to very shortly. We got a lot of exciting stuff. You ready? Yeah, I'm all set to go, man. You're uh, you're looking like your weather's pretty good out there in Vancouver. I'll tell you, the uh, the, uh, the the women are felt and the ice is going to melt, and we're loving life right now in Winnipeg because everything's above zero. <laughs> you say the weather's schmelt, you're going to schmelt your women. Yeah, no, the ice are the ice is gonna melt, and the women are felt. So these it's these AirPods. I need to get some new headphones. Soon. How's Vancouver? Vancouver's good, man. Spring's here. Weather's warm. The women are liberal, very liberal, I might add. And if to be quite honest, it might be a few nuggets short of a happy meal. So I've been told by some men. Well, hey, they are remixing the menu. So what the heck, right? <laughs> you see that new menu? No, I haven't had to look into it too much. To me, uh, McDonald's. I I've trained my kids at McDonald's is a once a year type of thing. It's a, it's a treat. It's not a, um, for us, it's not a, a, hey, I'm hungry. I'm going to go to McDonald's. It's like, hey, let's go into the kitchen and make something. You just gave me deja vu. Okay, you ready for this, Dave? Hmm. There was this one girl I dated for a period of time, and we ended up splitting. And I asked her, I said, okay, what was what's one of the reasons why this isn't working for you? And she said, when we go to McDonald's and you order a black coffee and I get a Big Mac combo, I feel like you're judging me. I said, why? <laughs> I just get a black coffee, a little bit of cream. She's like, well, I want you to have a Big Mac combo and fries too. I was like, I don't want that in my body. Well, why can't you? I feel judged didn't work out safe to yeah. say it's the same thing a lot of times with uh, with alcohol too you know people will sit down and if there's one person not drinking it makes everyone else uncomfortable it's like oh it's kind of like this this unwritten contract that if if, if i if, if i'm gonna do it then then you're gonna do it with me right like if, if you're gonna have a big mac i'm gonna have a big mac we're both gonna do this together right so we can go, gonna go ha, 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 ha. we're enjoying this right it's the same i i can understand where she's coming from but hey don't tell me how to enjoy things you do you you know one of the biggest pieces of feedback that i do get from females that i date is that they love that I don't drink because then they don't drink as much because of me. Because if I'm not going out and drinking, I'm having a Diet Coke or I'm having a water, they say, well, there's no sense in me drinking, so let's go do something different. If you want to save mm-hmm. money and you want to save calories in the waistline, I'm the way to go. Apparently. Yeah, we'll see how long that lasts. Wait till your <laughs> metabolism craps out. What do you mean? Wait till your metabolism craps out. No, I heard you the first time. <laughs> but what do you mean? <laughs> well, you'll get to a certain age where you kind of realize, huh, I can't eat like I used to. I mean, you eat pretty good right now, but you find that once you eat something, you notice it right away in the mirror. My dad used to say when I was a kid, he's like, once on the lips, forever on the hips. This is also literally when I would come home at seven years old and he'd be in like tidy whities like with like a side pose on the couch, shoving like a four liter pail of ice cream while watching TV. This is the visual. I hope this doesn't offend too many people. <laughs> by, by the way, my dad was severely overweight. He's about 290 pounds at like 6'5". I'm 235 for reference right now. Wow. Well, hey, listen, like I said, don't tell me how to enjoy things. You do you. In the words of uh, Bon Scott, it's a whole lot of woman. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole lot of woman. My, my boy's getting into ACDC right now, and I love it. Well, they're what, 9 and 11? 9 and 12. And? Yeah, he's well, he's... It's funny because people ask him if he was named after the guitar player for ACDC, and I say, no, it was just a happy coincidence, but the fact that he's uh, loving Angus Young and ACDC right now warms my heart. And when he does like the shake on stage, I don't know how he does. I've tried doing it playing guitar, you know, 20 some odd years old, but he's doing it from 20 all the way through 70 up to 80. Like he, and he rocks it. He's consistent. He's smooth. Speaking of music, I'm going to go see a show. Uh, after we're done recording, it'll be already done by the time this goes up. But I'm um, uh, Queens of the Stone Age, one of my, one of my favorite bands. Uh, Josh Homme and company are playing uh, Canada Life Center in downtown Winnipeg. And I've actually traveled uh, to numerous cities to go see these guys play. Most, most recently down to Minnesota, Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul, to be, to be truthful. And yeah, what a great show. They're awesome. I love them. Who's your favorite band these days? You're a big rock and roll guy. I know you're in the top 40 radio station now, but you still have to have you know, your finger on the pulse of rock, no? 
Well, listen, I'll, I'll go through a litany of albums. And I mean, I'll be honest with you, as much as I miss going through a vinyl and that romance of pulling a vinyl out of the uh, out of the jacket and putting it on and dropping the needle and going through the liner notes with a nice pair of headphones on, I do love the accessibility of having a YouTube music subscription and the fact that I can just talk to my AI and if I'm in the mood for an album, it'll play the album. If I'm in the mood for a single, it'll play the single. So I go through a lot of different stuff. But I, one number one band of all time for me is the Foo Fighters. That's just, Dave Grohl's my guy. He's got a good first name too, no? He's a Dave, man. He said it best. The guy's a Dave. Can't be that bad. He's a Dave. Actually, sorry. Quick side note. I had this girl I dated. Sorry, I had a little deja vu. I tell her stories that would suck, and she'd say, "Ah, oh, that's good. Did you find five dollars?" And I said, "No. Why would I find five dollars?" She said, "Well, if you found five dollars, that'd be exciting and an interesting story. You didn't." <laughs> <laughs> getting deja vu. I'm getting deja vu of like all these that. women that I've dated. I like that. All right, what do we got for a headliner? What are we going with? Headliner today. Okay, so the newest member of your Danbury Trashers in the UHL, out of 2004 to 2006, yours truly, starting goalie for the Trashman, the Trash Daddy, returns to the Danbury Ice Arena. <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned this a couple of weeks ago on the show um, that they had appropriated you for their uh, team, which is now defunct. And here's what I know about them. It was a waste company that decided to buy the hockey team. They called them the Trashers as a homage to the Atlanta Thrashers. And they had a Oscar the Grouch trash can type logo and whatnot. And now the team's defunct, but they just recruit players that are kind of trashy. Is that right? Uh, yes and no. So the Danbury Trashers were founded by Jimmy Galante. Uh, he was probably about like 40-ish at the time in Danbury, Connecticut. This is around 2003, 2004. He had a bunch of like different trash removing companies. And so that when he bought the team, originally his son AJ was in high school and he saw high school hockey in Danbury, Connecticut and was like, this atmosphere is incredible. This is electric. This is fun. We should get a pro hockey team in town. So I believe he invested, I think it was $500,000, might have been $700,000 into the UHL, the United Hockey League. This, is, this has been defunct. The U-Haul, baby, the U-Haul. For, if, you're, if you're young, you don't know what the U-Haul is. The U-Haul is legendary. Even you know guys my age know what the U-Haul is. But So he invested the money. They unveiled the team on April 1st. A lot of people thought it was an April Fool's prank because they unveiled the Danbury Trashers, named after the trash company. Not, not an homage to the Thrashers, the trash company that Jimmy Galante owned. And he dubbed his son, 17-year-old A.J. Galante, president and general manager of hockey operations. Why not, man? Why not? A little bit of nepotism there? Go for it. If it's just a fun little thing, I amazing. Awesome. I got, I got a couple of buddies that used to play with the Rapid City Rush. I got a buddy that used to play with the Fort Wayne Comet. So, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the U-Haul. It's interesting, though, because it went so uphill and so downhill so quickly because they, I think they got bounced in the first round of the playoffs, 4 5 the lockout season. They got a lot of really good NHL players out that season. And then 5 6 they lost the Kalamazoo Wings in the UHL, I believe the Colonial Cup Championship. Uh, might have been Game 5, Game 6. And then after that, Jimmy Galante got charged with a bunch of federal offenses, I think like racketeering and a bunch of other charges. Uh, spent, I think, four or five years in jail, and the team was defunct. So that was the two-year run of the Trashers. There's a Netflix documentary, Crimes and Penalties, I believe is the name of it. Great view, great watch if you get some free time to watch it. But uh, yours truly, although the Thrashers have, or the Trashers have not been around for almost two decades, your newest goalie, newest member. Love it. Love it. Can't wait for the residual checks to roll in, right? Zero dollars. It's zero pass region in Danbury, and there's zero dollars rolling in. Just a cool little edit. Also, shout out to AJ and the Talking Trash podcast he does with uh, Diamond and Zamesbury. AJ's a, a great guy, and I'm really excited to do some stuff with him in the spring. Also, I know Dave and I have been talking about this privately off the show, but Diamond Hands Amesbury, him and I are going to get some sparring in this summer. I was talking to him the other day. He's going to come to Vancouver. We're going to get some podcast stuff in as well. He's going to come on Sling the Biscuit, and then I'm going to do some stuff with the Talking Trash show as well. But we're going to get some sparring in. Diamond Hands and me. In the ring. Well, three minutes. It reminds me of uh, Peter Parker from Spider-Man. Parker, you and me, three minutes. <laughs> that was Macho Man Randy Savage. So I'm curious to know, last time we had talked about old Diamond Hands, he wanted to beat the wheels off you. Has that changed, or is this the uh, is this now his, is, is it you sparring and him actually trying? That's a great question. You know, it's going to be a very humbling experience and a great way to learn. You have one of the toughest fighters in hockey, if not the toughest fighter in hockey, and a guy that actually competes and fights real killers out there. And I'm going to get in the ring. Well, the... You call it the, the mat. The, the mat. And we're going to do a little bit of sparring. I got the reach on him. I got the length. But he's got the experience. He's got the power. So I don't think it's going to go as poorly as people, myself included, anticipate. But it's still going to be very humbling and a great learning experience because I'm very, very Use excited. Use those legs. Use those legs. You know what? I get told that the most in Muay Thai is that although I may be a little bit slow and maybe you know learning from the, the waist up, 
my kicks, I got those fast kicks and those fast legs and those fast checks because you know, goaltending got to have fast legs. So it is translating just a little bit. Although, I think I mentioned this to, uh, to you maybe two episodes ago. There was one guy that I was sparring in Muay Thai. I sparred him one time. I didn't touch him one time, not a single time. He worked me for the whole three minutes uh, for two rounds. We were together. And then a week later, I came back. And I wobbled him. I, I got him on the chin, and it was this feeling of like, oh my god! Like I, you know, I connected, and it was almost, you know, when you're playing video games, you get that vibration back from the controller to give you feedback for what you're actually doing. This mm-hmm. kind of felt the exact same way. I wobbled this guy. I actually did what I was trying to accomplish. So I'm making some progress. I don't know if I'll be able to wobble diamond hands, but I'm excited. I really am. Yeah. It, it, eventually, your brain changes from, oh wow, that was cool. I did something to follow up with a combination. You did it once, and I got to do it again. A couple more times, actually. Good. Well, I'm looking forward to that. I uh, yeah, let me know if there's room on that pod. I'd love I'd, I'd love to have some questions of old Diamond Hands. If only we could get you, him, and I in the same room in your recording studio in Winnipeg, or if we could find a recording studio here in Vancouver, that'd be so good to have a because I could sense that'll be like a good hour and a half, two hour discussion. Anything's possible, man. Anything's possible. Put it out into the universe. Manifest that. Even AJ to have AJ down to just talk to him for like two, two and a half hours about the trashers, about being a 17 year old general manager in professional hockey. There's guys in the Fed that are bozos that are general managers. Let alone you put a 17 year old kid who's still in high school to manage the team. I couldn't imagine just being behind the scenes witnessing that every single day, day in day out. Payroll comes in on Wednesday. You got to sign the checks, hand them out to the guys. You got to deal with management issues, HR. I don't even know if they would have had HR back then in 2004, 2005, but. Well, listen, the odd time you get these uh, absolute uh, idiot savants or phenoms, whether they're one or the other, where it just makes sense. I mean, I, I think back to the uh, the water boy when uh, you, you have the water boy uh, kicking for you but the um, or tackling for you, and then other teams, right, they decided to put the towel boy out to try at linebacker. I mean, it doesn't always work out, but every once in a while you, uh, you find the nugget. I mean, Moneyball is a great example of that. He picked up a guy who was just a stats guy, and he ended up uh, leaning on him to build the Oakland Athletics and do a playoff contender. So, you know, it, 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 diamonds in the rough are, are not as uncommon as a lot of people think. Was that two references there? The every squirrel finds a nut, the nuggets, the McDonald's reference from earlier, and then diamond hands, looking for the diamond in the rough? And and two movie references to, to, to boot. Money How about ball, that? Moneyball was great, too. We, we're not replacing Jambi. We're replacing what Jambi did. Fantastic movie. Mm. Mm, yeah, and an all-star cast, too. My goodness. Brad Pitt, Jonah Chris Hill. Pratt was in that, too. Chris Pratt was in that. He played the first baseman. In Moneyball? Yeah. I didn't know that. News to me. Yeah. Mm. Do you think the Trashers, though, have the best jerseys of all time, if not the top two, top three? They look really good. Love that logo, too. Uh, Sure. Yeah, for, for, for the sake of what they were, I, I'll give it to them, but... To me, there's a really fine line between a trendy jersey and then a classic jersey that will stay the test of time. Okay, what's the best one you ever wore? Best one I ever wore? Or worst one? I can tell you both. Uh, I actually really appreciated the fact that uh, I w- we were the last ones to wear this. When I was playing uh, Bantam Hockey, uh, AAA, we were sponsored by the Legion, and we were called the Legionnaires, and we had the Legion logo. Like when you drive by a Legion in, in Canada, which is a, you know for, for our veterans and whatnot, we have that logo on our chest, and man, did it ever feel good. And we were the last ones to wear it because they basically just, the entire hockey program my hometown of Fort McMurray was uh, the Oil Barons, was the Junior A team, the Tier 2 Junior A team, and then the uh, Midget, Bantam, Pee Wee all the way down became just the Barons. Not the Oil Barons, but the Barons, so it was more uniform all the way through. Um, before that, actually, um, uh, we were the last ones to wear it in Midget as well. We were called the uh, the Merchants, and it was this great, old, fantastic schooner, you know, five sails, just this beautiful. I, I think I used to have it. I got We were the last ones to have those jerseys, too, so we got to keep them when we were done before they moved into this. But, yeah, it was a really, really, really cool logo. I loved those. Um, the Oil Baron's logo was great. It was iconic. It was a, a Baron with a top hat sitting on a, a pile of oil, which was cool. Uh, worst ones I ever wore, not necessarily for a logo outside of some of the beer leagues I've played for, but I used to hate the, the jerseys with the holes in them. They, they tried to make them lighter. I didn't like those. Like it was just, it was holes. They ripped easy, especially when you got into a scrum, they would tear you. Like, you know, they don't know the ones I'm talking about. Like the jerseys, I had this, like the tiny little like pinholes all the way through them. Like the breathability holes. Yeah. I hated those. I and that, never liked the way they felt. Never liked the way they moved around on the shoulder pads. Nah, didn't like them. I don't really have those issues, so. Yeah, well, I mean, for you, I mean, as long as it's big enough to cover up all your jerseys, that's fine. I mean, I remember a time when, uh, I mean, Gar Snow was, was one of the ones that did it, but you'd, goalies would wear extra, extra, extra large jerseys because it's a little, just a little more fabric that can grab a piece of the rubber going by, right? I was going to say more, so I just got to, like, open the door, clean the thing. All right, two. No. 
That's really all I got to do, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> you do you do wear some nice practice jerseys, though. Some of the jerseys I have worn have been pretty nice. The, the Mississippi red ones, the a la Pittsburgh Penguin, St. Louis blue mid two thousands was crisp. The Watertown baby blue one, the Motor City Rockers, the purple one was great. I've actually I've been blessed to wear some really really good looking jerseys. Not in games, just on the bench, but some actual good looking jerseys. <laughs> Still looks good on camera. They can't tell if it's warm photos or game photos as long as the post guards are out and the pucks are on the net. Looks real to Instagram. I'm trying to see if I can find an, an image of the uh, the old logo that I had. If I find it, I'll send it to you so we can throw it up there. But there's some uh, some pretty cool logos. Pretty cool logos. Yeah. You had the idea last week to give away some trading cards for anybody could comment. Yeah. What the actual what the quote was from from it's the two intro. weeks ago. Two weeks ago. My yeah. apologies. Two weeks ago. And so we had a couple winners last week. How about we do this? Predictions for the Origin Diamond Hand sparring match. Leave a comment. I'll pick a couple comments. You'll get like a little merch prize, some trading cards and whatnot. How's that sound? You want to do that, Dave? Love it. Love it. Absolutely love it. But you also skated at MTS Center the other day, no? I was there. Listen, I had I had every intention to go out and skate with uh, with all my old uh, homies from playing beer league. We had, we speaking of great unis, May <laughs> we uh, we were called Gary Busey. So when you showed up to the ring and said, "All right, who are we playing tonight?" Uh, Gear, we're playing one guy. We're playing Gary Busey. We had uh, the Canucks white jerseys. That was our color scheme. And then a picture of Gary Busey, the actor, his face on the front. We all carried Busey as our last name name bar on the back and then had our numbers underneath that. And I, I remember asking my buddy, like, why, why, why are we called Gary Busey? He's like, because he's crazy. I went, good enough for me. And so all of these guys, and we played together for well over a decade, and there was a bunch of interchanges here and there. And uh, I told the story a couple weeks ago, but uh, one of the guys that uh, played with us, uh, Chris Kreviazuk, full credit to him, he and I had bumped into each other at a grocery store and just started talking about old times. And he happens to work for the Winnipeg Jets. And so he managed to get the the ice for us on an off day. And uh, yeah, we went down and skated. I didn't get enough gear because I was on uh, spring break the week before and out of town. So I didn't get a chance to appropriate enough gear to play, but uh, stood behind the bench and uh, had some laughs with the boys and Man, it was uh yeah, hung out in the locker room after and what a uh, what a time. It was really good seeing all those boys, some of them a little less hair, some of them a little more gray hair, some of them a little more thicker in the waist, some of them a little bit slower on the ice, but uh yeah, all smiles and just it's amazing you uh you know, you, you talk about some of the relationships you make along the uh along the way playing uh, minor pro hockey, but even beer league man, you share a locker room with uh, with some of these guys for a long enough time and you just kind of pick up where you left off and it was a really cool feeling uh, even though we actually did the math our youngest guys were 37, and our oldest guy was 59 years old. So the the gap of uh, players and age that we had in there was pretty uh, pretty significant. If you're females, y'all be in the geriatric pregnancy age range. <laughs> Getting close. Getting close. <laughs> Biological clock's ticking. I'm telling you, one of these days, man, I'm uh, I'm I'm starting to feel it a little bit here and there. But I mean, I'm still in my mid 40s. I'm still feeling good. But you know, when you start getting those feelings, you know that. You gotta you gotta do yoga every day. You gotta do the things. You gotta start eating right. You gotta do those if you want to keep feeling this way for as long as possible. Because one day it just it just shuts off. But you look good though. You're probably the best dressed guy there. With the whole scarf, the little pea coat. You look good. You look like you're gonna coach a professional game when well, you're kind of like when you're well, coaching the junior days. You know. Well, listen. If I'm standing behind a bench, I'm not gonna be wearing uh, you know New Balance back uh, back behind the bench or anything. I'm gonna be looking good. I don't care if there's only friends and family in the crowd. You gotta look good, feel good, play good. We've talked about this before. To the coach for the Regina Pats, we saw the sneakers. You look like a nerd. Yeah, that, that was not a good look. That was not a good look. You can get some pretty nice dress shoes now that have some uh, the lift that you need in there. You don't need to be uh, wearing the new balance out on the ice. They're going to be chirping the other guy. Holy moly. If you don't know what we're talking about, there was a bench brawl between the Regina Pats and the Moose Jaw Warriors the other day. They were down by a touchdown, 9-1. to one. Bench clearing brawl. Well, not bench clearing brawl, but a little bit of a brawl on the ice. Goalie fight and all. The head coach of the Regina Pats gets up on the boards and starts cussing and swearing at the other team's bench and their head coach. The dude's wearing like $10 sneakers from like Old Navy. Bro, put on some decent shoes if you're going to get up there. Because you can't obviously see the shoes behind the bench. If you're going to get up there so people can see your shoes, wear some nice shoes. You've got money. You're a Western League hockey coach. Not only that, but I mean, listen, you can buy some nice sneakers out there these days too. I mean, the Jordans, I mean, they're practically dress shoes. You see people showing up at uh, award shows wearing uh, wearing. $2,000 Jordans on their feet for crying out loud. They look crispy, just not behind the bench. That's what I'm wearing. <laughs> look at those. Look at those. Aren't they beauty? I can get away with these being dress shoes and casual shoes. That screams OnlyFans. Five bucks a month right there. See Dave's, <laughs> Dave's feet. <laughs> if you want to see the actual feet, I've got a weird toe that you might be interested in. <laughs> 
I don't know if I should be admitting this. I'm going for my first pedicure <laughs> next week. My woman and I, she dude, she convinced me to get a pedicure. Good. Go for it, do it, and do it on a regular basis. Take the advice from Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump. Take care of your feet. Take care of your feet. Seriously. Especially for the amount of times that you got to cram them into goalie skates and socks and sweating and whatnot. Do yourself a favor. Go for regular pedicures. Dudes are terrible for this. Go for a pedicure. Go for a pedicure. Go get your feet scrubbed. You'll do yourself a favor. Trust me. Speaking of doing yourself a favor, do you want to welcome the newest sponsor to the show? Sure do. Dave and I would like to welcome the newest sponsor to the show, Sense Arena, NHL Sense Arena. So here's the deal with Sense Arena. We all know ice times are going up in price. It's getting hard to find ice. It's getting hard to afford ice. And you really get that ice time to work on your skill sets to develop them to the next level. We all know this. Sense Arena is a virtual reality training tool that's transforming how players and goalies practice, allowing you to work on your hockey sense, sharpen your situational awareness, and improve your reaction speed. Whether you're living in rural Arizona with limited ice access, or in the heart of Montreal in the St. Lawrence, and you can't afford $500 an hour for ice, Sense Arena, for just over $1 a day, gives you unlimited access to over 100 plus drills for players and goalies, training plans from pro players and coaches, weekly challenges, and more. And right now, you can save $50 on an annual plan when you use the code BISCUIT. B-I-Z-K-I-T at hockey.sensorina.com. That is hockey, H-O-C-K-E-Y dot, not D-O-T, but the dot. Sensorina, S-E-N-S-E-A-R-E-N-A dot com. Code Biscuit will get you $50 off your annual plan. And thank you very much and a big warm welcome to Sensorina, the newest sponsor for the Sling the Biscuit podcast. Welcome. So listen, uh, speaking of uh, Sense Arena, not only am I going to be in the barn uh, for the uh, Flames and Jets game tomorrow night, it'll already have happened, so hopefully the Jets got a win for that one. Uh, I actually, when I was on spring break, uh, we went out to a cabin and they had cable, which is something I haven't had in quite a number of years, and actually got to sit down. There was a handful of Jets games and actually got to sit and watch start to finish instead of having to go to a friend's house or having to go to a watering hole or having to catch the highlights on YouTube. And uh, did, that was awesome. I was actually hoping to get out and do a little more hiking and a little more outdoor stuff, maybe some uh, some ice fishing and whatnot with the kids. But the weather was brutal. Like, it was bad. Uh, storm rolled in, blowing snow, snow. Even the St. Bernard was like, I ain't going outside. Uh, so we just kind of woke up every morning, uh, started a fire in the fireplace and kept a warm fire going all day and watched old movies and played air hockey and shuffleboard and chess and crib and Oh, I'll tell you, man, I, I, I'm closer to retirement than you are. I'm going to be really good at it. I promise you. Did your wife talk to you about that Upper Decker story you told last week at the cabin? No, she didn't watch the show. <laughs> 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 she does look good in her new uh, Slang in the Biscuit hoodie, though, doesn't she? Yeah, she looks awesome. Yeah, and listen, if you want to order one that's uh, autographed by Candace Wright, you can't get one. <laughs> <laughs> Game worn, autographed. Could you imagine? Game used? <laughs> no undergarments. She peed on it. <laughs> She's gonna watch this and be like, "Damn it, Travis!" Yeah, yeah. You're in trouble more than I am. I'm, well, I don't live with her. I'm not married to her, so <laughs> it's not my yeah, problem. Luckily, I am. I'm the lucky. I'm the lucky one. Trust me. Uh, but speaking of trips, though, I had a really awesome trip as well. Can we talk about that, Dave? Man, I uh, I was lucky enough to see a little bit of B-roll because I know you're putting together a video for a side project that you're doing for uh, hotels, uh, the rail uh, rail hotels across the country, and uh, whew, brings back some memories, man. I actually, um, my college graduation was there, and so, yeah, I've got fond memories of, of that hotel. It's awesome. You graduated the Palliser Hotel? I didn't graduate from that hotel. I gradu- My graduation ceremony was held there for my, for my program at SAIT in Calgary. What year would that have been? 2001. And what was it like? Was it the food good? The drinks were good? What was the, the ambiance like? That was great. We were all dressed up. Everyone graduated. And I think there's only three of us that are left in the industry. <laughs> wow. So I'd never been to a hotel of this level before. And if you are in the city of Calgary, I think you absolutely need to stay at the Palliser Hotel. And this is the reason why. The Hawthorne Dining Room, their brand new restaurant, has a 110-year-old fireplace. It's untouched. It's original. So when the first guy checked in in, you know, 1914, same fireplace that I sat at. The coffee was fantastic. Their afternoon tea, their treats, their snacks, the breakfast, all of it was incredible. The guest services were great. And just, I love the idea of being a, a piece of history. Although my stay at the hotel doesn't really matter. But to be at the hotel where so many things have happened over the last 110 years, I thought was just so cool. 
and my trip at the Palliser with my missus was awesome. They even gave us a fresh dog bed and a water bowl and a food bowl for our little corgi boy. So he could be accommodated too. Dave saw the, the, the video of him upside down, croissanted on the floor. Um, oh, yeah. He looked very comfortable. I'll be honest with you. One thing that I love most about those hotels, and they're pretty consistent all the way through the country when it comes to those rail hotels, is you walk in, marble floors, the accents and the finishes they have on the columns and, and the, the wainscoting. Like, it's just it's unbelievably cool. And like you said, it's, you're literally walking through history. And I think that's one of the reasons why you're going to love playing over in Spain this year is because that's, there's such rich cultural history over there. Like, when, when I was down in Mexico, 500-year-old uh, Spanish churches, cobblestone streets, and then you've got a Costco, you know, around the corner. Like, it's, it's a beautiful blend of modern, and they've really kept those those classic buildings. And I love the fact that here in Winnipeg, we have the Fort Gary. They've got the Palliser in Calgary. They've got, you know, the Banff Springs Hotel. They've got, the, you know, uh, Hotel McDonald in Edmonton. I know you're going to be going through all of these, but they're, they've got that very classic, classy look about them. As soon as you walk in, you just feel like, you should be wearing a vest and a tie. You know what? When we checked in and the whole experience, they all refer to me as Mr. Ridgen. And there's something about, even though technically that is my father's name, there's something about when I'm with my woman and they refer to me as, hello, Mr. Ridgen, what can we do for you? It's like, yes, I'm the man. Mm -hmm. This is my woman, but I'm the man. We're doing this. Thank you. <laughs> yep, and and they they are trained to serve. Yeah, because uh, listen, you you and I are just schlubs, but some of the people that roll through there sometimes they expect the best of the best, and I love that about those hotels. They don't care what walk of life you're from. This is the way you get treated when you walk through our doors, and pretty affordable too, because they're doing a hundred ten dollars for their hundred tenth anniversary. So hundred ten bucks to stay at one of the nicest hotels in Canada. Like, you can't get a better deal. My only complaint. I wish that I personally had gold status because if I had gold status, I would have had access to their lounges. And they were doing an eggs Benedict and a Bavarian crepe buffet both days. I missed out on that. Man, well, hurry up and get your gold status. What do you got to do to get that? Just stay there more and spend more? I'm actually, uh, I think, two nights away, maybe three nights away from getting silver status, and then I got to get five more nights to get gold status. But the gold status, then everywhere I go, I get, I get discounts, I get meals, I get all these lovely perks. I think when we stayed two more nights, because... Obviously, I don't drink, but uh, my woman does. She's going to get absolutely crippled when we walk in the door. Drinks, Mr. Ridgen? Yep, tequila for her. <laughs> mm -hmm. Listen, man, like I said, they roll out the red carpet for you, and uh, there's a reason why, because they are they're, they're, they don't have exactly have a, a red cross above their door. They're not there to uh, you know for charity. They're there to make money. Chateau Lake Louise was really great, too. It's uh, I would argue probably one of Canada's three most famous, if not three most popular hotels, and to be in a place that's burned down three times, <laughs> and they rebuilt it every single time. Uh, the actual building itself has been around since, I think, 1924. So they're coming up on their 100th year anniversary this season. And just to be able to eat dinner with the, or have coffee, afternoon tea, whatever it is, with the, the lake view of Lake Louise, absolutely stunning. They have activities outside where you get to roast marshmallows. So I was teaching my woman how to roast marshmallows, which is really cool. We're making schmoes, as uh, Buzz from Toy Story would say, delicious hot schmoes. And it was just a really good time. It was really great to be in the element, to be hiking or not necessarily hiking but like walking around the the mountains and to experience again a piece of history like you mentioned before which so many other people have seen and it's just one drop in the bucket but it's so cool that's awesome man i'm uh yeah i'm really happy that you're going around and doing that and uh i got yeah, gotta give you credit it. though i do have to give you credit that's because it was your idea that with you know things with my woman turning out so well at this point in time take her on a trip see how it goes and she did such a great job we're doing another trip at the end of the month good for you man like i said if you can travel with uh your your girlfriend, that's a good measuring stick for if your relationship's going to go for it. Because, you know, when you first start dating, you're usually with friends. You go out with friends. You go out in mixed company. But if it could just be the two of you in a sardine can known as an airplane or a vehicle traveling somewhere and it's just the two of you, that is a really good test of how things are going to progress forward. So I highly recommend that to anyone who's in a new relationship. It's interesting, too, to contrast. It doesn't even have to be an expensive trip, too. I mean, just... Go camping. Go uh, go on a road trip somewhere. Go 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 for a you know five hour drive and spend a day somewhere, and then the five hour drive back. These these are really good examples of uh, of how to see if you're really going to get along with somebody. I'm not sure if you want to get into this too much, and feel free to tell me to stop if you don't want to, Dave. But I've dated women that really kind of make your life chaotic. Maybe they don't appreciate certain things, or like they just are not a compliment. And to be able to find a woman who is a compliment to your life, and to make uh, a chaotic situation peaceful as opposed to the other way around is very refreshing so like the weather's not great it's snowing she's happy to be around there or you know maybe you know there's a way to get into the restaurant or you know whatever problems may occur the fact that she's positive and she's a compliment to that it's a very refreshing peaceful feeling 
I'm happy for you, man. I've uh, had the pleasure of meeting her briefly over a uh, Zoom conversation, but a very, very lovely woman. You're a lucky guy. Once she sobers up and gets glasses, you're in big trouble. I know my mom likes her too, so. There you go. All signs are pointing to good. Just saying. <laughs> My speaking, mom's of pointing, sp- speaking of pointing to good, uh, Matt Murray got some good news about Muzz. Yeah, my boy. He's, uh, he should be returning the next week or two. So Matt Murray's practicing with the Leafs full practice now after getting the double hip surgery in September. Same surgery that I went through, but he got both hips. I got one. It's awesome to see him back, man. He's, he's such a good guy. He's such a, a great athlete, a great man, somebody that inspires me on a very regular basis. Every time we have a conversation, I'm always getting inspired by things him and I talk about, and I couldn't wish him anything better. I wish him nothing but the best, and I'm looking forward to seeing him with his first game back. I I would love to go and fly out to Toronto and see his first game back, but I have a feeling it's going to be a last-minute thing, kind of like when he was playing last year in Vancouver after his ankle injury, so I might just end up uh, getting like a legal streaming website, stream the game for free, and then watch it here in my, uh, my living room in my apartment. Nice. Well, listen, that double hip surgery is going to do him a lot of favors. That's for sure. He's going to be able to go into that eagle spread a la Eddie the Belfour. Eddie the Eagle Belfour from Carmen, Manitoba. Still got the sign saying, welcome to Belfour country. Or it says, actually says, welcome to Carmen, home of Eddie Belfour. But still, <laughs> pretty cool. Is that a thing, though? They have the Eddie Belfour sign for Carmen, Manitoba? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a little faded. Like, it, it went up probably about 20 years ago, but it's got all of his uh, all of his helmets there on the billboard. And it says, welcome to Carmen, home of Eddie Belfour. You know, Eddie Belfour was such an interesting character. Obviously, I've never met him. And, I mean, his prime of his career was before I was even born or twinkling my dad's eye, if you want to put it that way. But he was just so detailed in his approach from stories that I've heard of him. I mean, staying up till 3 or 4 in the morning sharpening his skates because he wanted to find the right, the perfect skate sharpening and didn't want anybody else to mess with this stuff. Or even I, I heard a story from somebody that he worked with for a period of time that if you added value and you were potentially able to help Eddie in his pr- pursuit of becoming the best goaltender that he could in his career, he'd give you all the time of day. He was always interested. He always had time to listen to you. If you provided no value, get lost. Which, although at the time I thought, wow, what a prick. <laughs> this is like years ago. As I'm getting older, I'm kind of starting to realize, you know, that's actually a good mentality to have. Not in a, maybe so much in a selfish way, but being careful about who you dispense your energy to and who gets your time, who gets your efforts, who you actually care about. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to give time to some guy who's just looking for autographs when I'm playing for the Toronto, obviously not myself, but he's playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs, playing for the Florida <laughs> Panthers. Like, I got shit to do, right? Yeah, well, listen, it, it, it's a balance. I mean, uh, I take it from uh, Bobby Hall, God rest his soul, who said, uh, you know, those are the people that uh, that pay your salary. And so he didn't leave the rink until every single person that wanted an autograph got an autograph. He understood that, that it, it's show business. It is 100% show business, and he realize that and there's other people who can't be bothered by it which is like they which is why they like playing in some of these secondary markets which is why you know where, where they don't get bothered and whatnot we've had that conversation before about a few players but it's a, it's a balance it's a 100 percent balance and it comes down to what are you comfortable with and what's going to help you be the most successful he was just such an interesting character though eddie belfour one of the most successful goaltenders of all time, one of the greats, Manitoba legend. I don't think anybody talks about the fact that he was a Manitoban enough. You just think of Eddie Belfour, Eddie the Eagle, Dallas Stars, Toronto Maple Leafs, but absolute Manitoba Chicago legend. Chicago Blackhawks. Chicago Blackhawks, San Jose Sharks, Florida mm-hmm. Panthers. Yeah, Played a he, couple uh, he did, man. He was great. Like, he was he was a... I'm not going to say he... He was part of the goaltending revolution. He was part of the Patrick Waugh era where they came in and there was more of that stacked pads you know, instead of stacking on the side you went down to the butterfly he exemplified that and he was he was part of the revolution curtis joseph could also be thrown in there another manitoban trevor kid could be thrown in there there's legend i don't know if i i, I don't know if i throw him in the legendary status as far as uh play but he's a legendary guy absolutely he's a beauty great guy i've, I've had a, a, more than one conversation with that guy around the rink and yeah he's uh he's a beauty can i explain why i think he's a legend sure it kind of resonates with me. And I was telling Dave before we started recording, Trevor Kidd resonates with me because, granted, he played in the NHL. I played in the FPHL in the minor ranks of pro hockey. But Trevor Kidd was never the greatest NHL goalie. As a matter of fact, far from it. And neither have I been. But God damn that he has some good style. The checkerboard pads throughout his entire career, the soul patch, or maybe even goatee got so long at one point, the hair, the salad coming out of the back. Resonates. No, I'll, leave it at, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> look good, feel good, play good. Yeah, no, Trevor Kidd, when he was with the Calgary Flames, actually one of our goaltenders that, that I played with, Terry Lays, uh, that was his that was his hero growing up. He uh, he wanted to be just like Trevor Kidd, and the fact that I got to, uh, the first time I met him, I'm like, I used to play with a goalie that looked up to you, and he went, cool. <laughs> Shut up, Dave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, let's actually talk some hockey. 
Uh, no, Trevor Kidd's a wonderful guy. He was part of the Jets broadcast for uh, for a handful of years, and uh, good dude. So you'll see him every once in a while out on the golf course. I would love to get him on the show. If you and I can find a way to get Trevor Kidd in studio at your Energy 106 studio to talk about talk to him about all this stuff, type of stuff, yeah, that'd be so cool. That shouldn't be hard. Yeah, I, you know what? I can almost say I, I can almost guarantee that. Put that uh, put that down. We'll make that happen sometime over the summer. Okay, why don't we do this too? If you're in the comment section, leave a comment. What do you want to hear us ask Trevor Kidd? For those that are old enough to know what type of legend Trevor Kidd is, leave a comment for the questions you want to ask. I'll put them in a Google Doc sheet. And then when we go to sit down with Trevor Kidd, we'll pop that out this summer. Love it. Do they have a sign for, because uh, he was from Dougald, right? Dougald, Manitoba? Not that I know of. I don't go to Dougald very often. <laughs> Not many people do. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned Corey Koski, great uh, Canadian uh, ball player who played in the major leagues uh, for, uh, for a number of years. Uh, the Jays are back, baby. Oh, I don't have a lot of faith in them this year, but they're back. The boys of summer are back. Anytime you want to talk baseball, you let me know. It seems like all the Toronto sports teams are maybe not doing so well these days. Maybe the Leafs are doing a little bit better than the rest, but the, yeah, the, the Raptors the, and the Jays. Raptors, uh, as of recording, are on a 17-game losing streak. Ooh. At this point, you got... No, seriously, at this point, you cheer against them because you want a higher draft pick. That, that's really the only saving grace. Hope for a lottery pick. On, on the Toronto topic, did you see the Ryan Reeves interview the other day? They told him that he had to put a shirt on, and he was disgruntled. He was voicing his concerns that he wanted to not wear a shirt for his interviews. Yeah, well, listen, I'm I'm, I'm kind of torn on this because there was an issue about this a decade and a half ago because a lot more, and, and my roommate was one of them. We talked about it before, Leah Hextall, where she was, her beat was going down into the locker room and interviewing these players after the game. And it had to be like, okay, guys, somebody's coming in. And uh, the odd time somebody would be coming out of the shower and she had to avert her eyes. And so I, I think it just, you know, it, be, because if you're going to be having, you know, men and women in those locker rooms, uh, it's got to be understandable that they're not going to be completely naked or, or is it, well, you know, you're in their space and you got to respect them. Like it's a big conversation. The no shirt thing. I don't know. I mean, if you're, you just got off the ice and you're sweating like crazy and you peel off your under armor because you want to get all that off of you and kind of actually feel some nice natural air on your butt. I told you, and they're going to shove a microphone in your face. Don't tell me I got to put a t-shirt on. I'll do the, you want to do the interview? This is how I'm doing the interview. Well, let's also be honest too. Like Ryan Reeves is a truly masculine dude. Hey, he's a big it's, boy. He's a huge dude. He's in great shape. He's got a fantastic physique. He worked hard for that physique. So let the man show it off. He's not looking like Phil Kessel, who looks like he's shaped like a pear. The guy's got great oh, physique, bolder shoulders, good pecs, right? And here's another thing too: is to show the younger generation this is what excellence looks like. This guy's in great shape. Aspire to be like this, as opposed to again Phil Kessel, who's shaped more like a pear. And he loves his glizzies. Uh, <laughs> you know what? Like I said, I I think that when you go into the locker room. And you're asking for a, a total pullback of the curtains. You're looking for the behind the scenes stuff, and you have a period of time to get in there. You don't tell the person you're interviewing what you want them to wear or say or do. You're, you're looking for an audio clip. So, microphone in face. Hey, here's the question. Who cares? Like, they just you're you're in their space. You know, he's not telling you to use a different microphone. Hey, why aren't you using an SMB7? I'm not, I'm not doing the interview unless I use a Sure SMB7. It doesn't go the other way. I don't like the tie you're wearing. I'm not doing the interview if you're going to wear a tie like that. So you're walking into an athlete's room. You're, you're walking into their room. You don't get to dictate the rules. You have my wheels turning because I'm thinking, I know from my experience, when teams I played with, with the media team doing like mic'd up stuff for different guys, we would say the most messed up things to the microphone. Like, hey, you know, something about like what we did last night or, you know, obviously inappropriate things you can't put on the show. But specifically because they will listen to it afterwards, get a good laugh, and they know they can't post it out, out there. So now I'm thinking, okay, when you get more females in the media industry coming into the locker room, imagine a guy like Rebo is like, hey, Leah, check this out. <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, so there, 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 there has to be a line. I, I, I don't disagree that there should be a set of rules about as far as conduct in the locker room. Like, you don't walk over the logo in the middle of the room. Like, those are pretty, you know, unwritten rules. But... Yeah, I, I understand there has to be a balance, but if the dude's just topless, so what? I don't know. I don't see the big deal in it. <laughs> what do you what do you prefer, with or without? <laughs> and, you, and you know what? You, you would definitely not see it go the other way, as far as allowing men into a uh, women's locker room after a NCAA game, like a NCAA game, like Caitlin Clark, Caitlin Clark, and uh, um, oh the. Uh, Oh, I can't remember the name of their team now. Anyways, Caitlin Clark uh, beat LSU in the uh, to make it to the Final Four. 
And that, that, that tournament's over. Oh, actually, the, that game's done as of a couple of days ago. I haven't watched it yet because we're recording early. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't think you would be having uh, a student – um, interviewers going into the males going into the female locker room while they're while they're all changing looking for a sound bite. So you know it, it is a bit of a double standard there. I understand it, but yeah, I, I don't think it has anything to do with Ryan Reeves' physique. It's just like if he's comfortable he's in the locker physique. room with his shirt off. Yeah, it'd be a bit. Listen, regardless if he has a great physique or not, if he wants to be uh, if he's topless during an interview while he's getting in, you want if you want to interview him while he's getting undressed, that's what you're gonna have to deal with. I'm kind of curious now, what is the protocol for the women's professional hockey? Because I'm assuming there's men's reporters, like males males that are working the media coming into the dressing room. What's the protocol? Like, Do they have to wait? Do they just come in there? Do they turn their eyes? I'm very curious now. I've never thought about this, Dave. You've given me something to think about now. Well, listen, if someone can uh, enlighten us on that situation, I do not know what the protocol is, but I'm I'm pretty sure it, doesn't, it does not go both ways. But one thing that does not go both ways is the next sponsor for the show is the team at manscaped.com. If you're in the locker room asking people with... Or without, you're going to want to get the new Beard Hedger in the Manscaped Lawnmower. Here's why. The Beard Hedger has 20 different lengths for fading and taping your beard, the same way that I do every single week. It is water-resistant, waterproof, excuse me, 60-minute battery life. It's awesome. I use it every single week and have been for almost two years now. The Lawnmower, all your below-the-belt grooming, tapering it up for date night. Their skin-safe technology makes it so that you can't nick yourself, and it's awesome. So go to the link in the video description. Go to manscaped.com. The code BISKIT, B-I-Z-K-I-T, will get you 20% off and free shipping only from the team of Manscaped. Thanks for sponsoring the show. I shave with Manscaped. <laughs> the only thing worse you could have done coming out of that ad transition was if you drove a cargo ship into a bridge. <laughs> oh, my God. Listen, we've talked on this show before, and it's one, one of the things that you'll uh, you'll notice as you get older is you have an appreciation for bridges as far as the engineering that goes behind it and whatnot. Man, what an absolute screw-up that was. And that is going to affect transportation and goods coming in to the inland northwest in the United States of America. Like, it's uh, that is a huge blunder. Like, wow. And I'm not even going to get into... Some of the theories that I've written on it is not worth it, and I don't want to get the internet fired up on this one. But man, oh man, like what an absolute Why don't blunder. we do this, Dave? Leave a comment in the comment section. How and why do you think the bridge collapsed by the cargo ship? Wrong answers only. Perfect. I don't mind that. Can Go you imagine, though? Think about this for a second. You're one of the staffers on the cargo ship. Probably, what, 100 guys they have on the ship? Give or take. Uh, I wouldn't even know. I wouldn't even know how many you would need on that. I've seen a couple of movies that deal with cargo ships like, uh, what was it, uh, Captain, uh, with, uh, with that guy, Forrest Gump, Tom Hanks, Cap- Captain Phillips, Captain Phillips. Outside of that, I really don't know how big of a crew you need. I do know that there was some lives that perished. There was some road repair crews that were on the bridge at the time, and they've recovered two out of the six, I believe. Uh, so, you know, obviously prayers go out to their family. That's... Never easy to go through, especially when there's a blunder like that. But no, I, I have no idea how many you would, uh, how many bodies you would need to man a cargo ship of that size. It could, it could have been worse. We only killed six people because if you think about it, if they had done that in rush hour when the bridge was full, oh my god, imagine how many people would have passed. But at least on the bright side, it was only one car, or I didn't even think it was a car. I think it was six guys doing construction on the yeah. bridge. So yeah, there was all it was all road crew, which is just uh, again terrible. But it, it could have been a lot worse uh, as far as the casualties. But the the amount of logistical nightmares that they're going to have to reroute and oh man, just they don't even have the bridge out of the water yet. And I think they only have two lanes open at the time of recording uh, to have uh, those large cargo ships go through. So that is it's going to be a major, major, major backup. It's just terrible, truly terrible. The bridge is however many years old, how many decades old. The cargo ship is however uh, decades old. And to think of how many crossings go through that bridge. And how every single time up to this point, they haven't had anything like this. You know what I mean? Like how many safe crossings they have? I find that interesting. Yeah. No, again, I, and I'm not going to get into the, any of the uh, the conspiracy theories, but man, oh man, that is really going to, uh, yeah, bottleneck a lot of logistics uh, through that area for sure. It's too bad. really is too bad. Well, anyway, thank you very much for listening to the show. My name is Travis Ridgen. I'm here in downtown Vancouver. That's... Dave Wheeler, home of the Winnipeg Handshake in Winnipeg, Manitoba, between the Red and the Cinnamon River. We do a new episode of Sling the Biscuit every single Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern in downtown Toronto, 10 a.m. in the prairies of Saskatchewan and Manitoba. 
9 a.m. in Calgary, Alberta, and then 8 a.m. here on the Pacific Northwest Coast. Thank you very much for listening. Leave a review on Apple or Spotify if you're listening to the mobile version. Subscribe on the YouTube video version of the show. And we look forward to seeing you next week for the next episode of the show. We'll see you then. Please like and subscribe now.